is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear John and Joan talking about their new school. Look at questions one to five on the form now. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hi, John. How's it going? Pretty good. What about you? Terrific. So what do you think of our new school? A1, man. Much better than the old one. In fact, I'm going to write an article for the London Times about it. Really? Yeah. Have you got half an hour? Maybe you should give me some ideas. If you buy me a coffee. No problem. How do you think I should start? Introduce the headmaster? Why don't you compare it with the old one? You know, the buildings, laboratories, language lab, computer equipment, fitness center, pool, stuff like that. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. I mean, the old one was pretty bad, and the new headmaster seems like a great guy. Actually, all the teachers I've met seem pretty decent. Same here. The French teacher is really cool, and he's actually French, not like Smith at the old place. He sounded less French than even you do. Hey, my accent is perfect. Dream on. But why don't you start with what the headmaster told the school this morning, you know, his ideas on education and things. Yeah, I liked that. None of that stuff about how we must study hard for our futures and the honor of the school. There's no free lunch, that type of thing. He sounds pretty progressive. What did he say? If we teachers succeed in stimulating your minds, stimulating you to ask questions and think critically, then you will discover the joy of learning, enjoy your studies, and therefore work hard. Hey, what a memory. Those are his exact words. Do you remember what he said next? Something about it's good to keep fit. Yeah. Do you remember him mentioning those experiments showing that after half an hour of exercise, our brains are much more creative for hours? And put you in a better mood. Did you see the fitness center? Look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen to more of the conversation between John and Joan and answer questions 6 to 10. I went early this morning for a workout. Fantastic. Olympic-sized pool, not like that tiny 25-meter thing we had before. And the gym has absolutely everything. I counted 10 exercise bikes, some rowing machines, really good ones. Are you going to go? I've been every other day for two weeks. Feel great. Hey, maybe I should interview some of the teachers and students for my article. Of course you should. Wow, just thought of it. I'm doing a video project. Maybe I could film the interviews. Makes sense. And I could take a few photos. Maybe the newspaper would use one or two of them. The main hall is awesome. Really light, lots of windows, and a huge stage. Big enough for a 60 or 70 person orchestra. Did you see Mr. Clark, the old music teacher? I think he's the only teacher here from the old school. He is, and he was the only decent teacher. I met him in the hall. He's really happy, planning to double the size of the school orchestra. It's great. Okay, let's find what we're going to do. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part two. You are going to hear an introduction to some London parks. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the London Park Society. It's a lovely day, so in half an hour or so, we'll go outside and start our tour of some of London's famous royal parks. But for the next half an hour or so, while we enjoy our coffee and biscuits, I'll tell you something. About some of these wonderful parks, a brief history, and some of their special attractions. I also have a few slides to show you. First, what do we mean by royal park? In short, they once belonged to or were established by order of a king or queen of England, or at least a member of the royal family. And it's a good job they did. They provide quiet and natural scenery. Places that we might not be able to enjoy today if our former rulers had just put buildings everywhere. Let's start with the most famous Hyde Park. This park offers some of London's finest scenery and covers 630 acres and a perimeter of four miles. I know we have friends from France here, so I'd better give it in metric. That's about 260 hectares. And 6.5 kilometers. Hyde Park dates back to 1536, when King Henry VIII got the land from the monks of Westminster Abbey. Much of the later design, its layout, was done by the architect Decimus Burton in the 1820s, who took full advantage of the area's high and low land. It was the original site of the Crystal Palace. Built for the Great Exhibition of 1851, the original ancestor of today's World Expos, like the one that will be held in Shanghai in 2010, I think. So it's been popular for a long time, and not only the people who live and work near the park like it. Many famous rock bands like Pink Floyd and the Rolling Stones have put on big rock concerts here. I still remember the Rolling Stones concert there in—I、uh, forget the exact year. It was around 1968 when I was a university student. Now look at questions 16 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions sixteen to twenty. I mentioned the architect Decimus Burton. He designed the very impressive grand entrance to the park. The whole front is about a hundred and seven feet long. Look at the four magnificent pillars that support the central entrance, and that carving on the wall. Here's a close-up of a naval and military procession, and the gates made of iron and bronze. With a beautiful Greek-style flower design, one of the most popular sites in the park is Speaker's Corner, in the northeast corner, where you can hear British people exercise their right to free speech. There may be a dozen or more at any one time, each standing on a soapbox and spouting usually controversial views on any topic you can think of: religion, politics, fox hunting. Trade unions, Europe, tourists, etc. Lots of arguing. It's great fun. And south of the Serpentine Lake is the memorial to Diana, Princess of Wales. It's an oval stone fountain that opened on July the sixth, two thousand and four. Another memorial in the southeast corner of the park is the Albert Memorial, Queen Victoria's monument to her husband of that name. I see that time is getting short. So I'll be a bit briefer with the other parks that we'll see today and tomorrow. Regent's Park. 
It has a fantastic landscape and is known as the jewel in the crown. Regent's Park covers 487 acres, that's 197 hectares, including Primrose Hill, and has the largest outdoor sports area in London. Rugby, basketball, soccer, netball, cricket, it's all here. St. James's Park, with its royal, political and literary associations, is at the very heart of London. It's overlooked by not one, but three royal palaces. The most ancient palace is Westminster, now known as the Houses of Parliament. Then there's St. James's Palace, which used to be the King or Queen's residence, despite the fact that the monarch has lived in the Third Palace, Buckingham Palace, since 1837. There's so much to see in or by St. James's Park. Bands give concerts twice a day in the park at weekends during the summer. And tomorrow is Saturday, so we're in luck. Then there's the changing of the guards. The Queen's lifeguard changes daily at Whitehall, just nearby, Monday to Saturday at 11am, an hour earlier on Sundays, and at Buckingham Palace every day at 11.30 in April, May and June, and on alternate days in July and March, if the weather is OK. Finally, we'll visit Greenwich Park, which is the oldest enclosed royal park. It's situated on a hilltop, with impressive views over the River Thames to the Docklands and the City of London. It contains several historic buildings, including the Old Royal Observatory, the Royal Naval College, the National Maritime Museum and the Queen's House. Well, it's time to go. A ten-minute walk and we'll be at Hyde Park. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a discussion between a college tutor and two students, Christina and Ibrahim. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. First of all, I'd just like to say, Christina and Ibrahim, that I really enjoyed watching your video about student life last week. And I could see that the rest of the group did too. You did really well, and I hope that you got a lot out of it. I'd like to use this tutorial as a feedback session where you reflect on the experience of doing the project. Uh, so, Christina, I was wondering, what did you enjoy most about making the video? I liked using the camera. Is it the first time you've operated one like that? Yes, it is. Well, the results were very good. Anything else? I also enjoyed visiting one of the British students we filmed. I'd never been inside a British home before. OK, Christina, thanks. Uh, what about you, Ibrahim? What did you enjoy? Well, for me, it was a very good chance to get to know students who are on other courses, because everyone in our group is studying English, and we don't usually have much to do with the rest of the college. Yes, good. Do you think you'll maintain the contact now? Well, I hope so. I've invited three of them to have dinner with me next week. Great. If you haven't decided what to make yet, I can tell you they'll love trying Arab dishes. And, of course, it's good for your English, too. Uh, Christina, what did you find? What was the most useful aspect of the project from the point of view of the English practice? I think, 
When we were being shown how to edit the film, we had to follow the instructions, and that was very good practice for me. And I also learned some technical words that I hadn't heard before. Hmm. What about you, Ibrahim? What was the most useful for your English? It was listening to the British students because they don't speak as slowly as most of the tutors on our course. I think they speak at natural speed, so it forces me to get used to it. And they use a lot of slang. So you learn some new words which will be useful. Yes. Good. I'm glad it helped. Well, we've talked a little bit about enjoyment and about language practice. Were there any other benefits? What else did you feel you'd learn from the project? Was it useful in other ways? Yes. Well, firstly, I learned how to use a video camera,、mm -hmm. and also I think I really learned a lot about working together with other people. I've never done anything with a group before, and we had to find ways of cooperating、um, and compromising. And sometimes persuading people when they don't agree with you. Yes, that is a very useful experience. I know. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. What about you, Ibrahim? Well, I think I learned a lot about how important editing is. When you're filming, you think that everything's going to be interesting, but in fact, we cut around half of it in the end, and then it was much better. Good. Well, one last thing I'd like to ask: What mistakes do you think you? As a group, that is made. I mean, to put it another way, if you had to do it all over again, is there anything you'd do differently? We didn't plan very well. For example, we didn't decide on dates when we'd complete each separate step of the project, and we should have agreed about that in the beginning because we were always late with everything. Right. Anything else? I think we should have tried to experiment more with the camera. I mean, with angles and the focus and that kind of thing. So you should have been more ambitious. Do you agree, Ibrahim? Not really. In fact, I think we were too ambitious. We were inexperienced and we didn't have a lot of time, and we tried to do too much to make a long film.、Hmm. Next time, I would make a shorter one and try to get the quality better. Well, that's very interesting. Next semester, we will be doing another video project with a different content, of course. But you'll have an opportunity to put into practice what you've learned this time. Now, do you have any ideas about?、Uh, That is the end of part three. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part three. Part four. You will hear a talk about scientific research in the continent of Antarctica. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about that remarkable continent, Antarctica. Remote, hostile, and at present uninhabited on a permanent basis. For early explorers, it was the ultimate survival contest. For researchers like me, it remains a place of great intellectual challenge, while for the modern tourist, it's simply a wilderness of great beauty. First, some facts and figures. Antarctica is a place of extremes, the highest, coldest, and windiest continent, and over 58 times the size of the UK. The ice cap contains almost 70% of the world's fresh water and 90% of its ice. But with very low snowfall, most of the continent technically falls unbelievably into the category of desert. Huge icebergs break off the continent each year, while in winter, half the surrounding ocean freezes over, which means its size almost doubles. Research and exploration has been going on in Antarctica for more than 200 years and has involved scientists from many different countries who work together on research stations. Here, science and technical support have been integrated in a very cost-effective way. Our Antarctic research program has several summers-only stations and two all-year-round ones. I was based on one of the all-year-round ones. The research stations are really self-contained communities of about 20 people. There's living and working space, a kitchen with a huge food store, a small hospital, and a well-equipped gym to ensure everyone keeps fit in their spare time. The station generates its own electricity and communicates with the outside world using a satellite link. Our station, Zero One, had some special features. It wasn't built on land, but on an ice shelf, hundreds of meters thick. Supplies were brought to us on large sledges from a ship 15 kilometers away at the ice edge. Living in the Antarctic hasn't always been so comfortable. Snow buildups caused enormous problems for four previous stations on the same site, which were buried and finally crushed by the weight. Fortunately, no one was hurt, but these buildings became a huge challenge to architects, who finally came up with a remarkable solution. The buildings are placed on platforms, which can be raised above the changing snow level, on legs which are extendable. Food is one of the most important aspects of survival in a polar climate. People living there need to obtain a lot more energy from their food, both to keep warm and to undertake heavy physical work. Maybe you know that an adult in the UK will probably need about 1,700 kilocalories a day on average. Someone in Antarctica will need about 3,500, just over double. This energy is provided by foods which are high in carbohydrate and fat. Rations for field work present an additional problem. They need to provide maximum energy, but they must also be compact and light for easy transport. Special boxes are prepared, each containing enough food for one person for 20 days. You may be familiar with coffee processed by freeze-drying, which preserves the quality of the food product while making a large saving in weight. Well, this type of presentation is ideal in our situation. It wasn't available to earlier polar explorers whose diet was commonly insufficient for their health. I think that being at the cutting edge of science has a special appeal for everyone working in Antarctica, in whatever capacity. As a marine biologist, my own research was fascinating, but it's perhaps climate change research 
that is the most crucial field of study. Within this general field, surveying changes in the volume and stability of the ice cap is vital, since these may have profound effects on world sea levels and on ocean currents. A second important area is monitoring the size of the hole in the ozone layer above Antarctica, since this is an indicator of global ultraviolet radiation levels. Thirdly, bubbles in the ice sheet itself provide an index of pollution, because frozen inside them are samples of previous atmospheres over the past 500,000 years, and these provide us with evidence for the effects of such human activities as agriculture and industry. There are an increasing number of opportunities for young people to work for a period in Antarctica, not only as research assistants in projects like mine, but also in a wide range of junior administrative and technical positions, including vacancies for map makers. I hope that the insights I've provided will encourage you to take up these opportunities in this fascinating continent. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.